So, as a brief introduction, uh, let me just describe the situation with the potential new applications, and uh, or that we can abbreviate to PUA, or also calling poor. So, if poor stops my tongue, just remember that's uh, PUA if it stands for potentially unwanted application. Overall, the number of mm -hmm. the, the considering the volume of uh, infections and, and detections that come with etonetry, the malware can, uh, consists of, it's, it's probably a small chunk of the entire scope of detections. Uh, so I would say that poor is probably the biggest problem on, on Mac OS. If you look at the customer base, our customer base, uh, then malware would probably be intercepted on 1% of uh, that base, while uh, uh, potential and water applications go up to 16%. So the chunk, the volume of people affected by poor on Mac OS platform is substantially larger. <coughs> Looking at uh, the uh, uh, geographical location of where the telemetry is coming in, uh, the mostly affected regions are uh, the United States and Europe, but there is so also a fair bit of uh, Reports come from Australia, uh, South Korea, China, some other places. But that also uh, backs up uh, or underlines where our customer base is located. Uh, if you look at the top malware threats, they aren't that many, or the, the biggest problem would probably be sitting in that uh, long tail covered by AVA. Uh, but if you consider the uh, potentially unwanted application share, it's a much more diversified place. You can have you have uh, many more vendors fighting for the crown uh, in that area. So let's get into the analysis of the application. It, it is distributed as an install installer bundled with various forms of potentially unwanted applications. So. To give a bit of context, there are many developers that build software and uh, they want to make it free, they want to get some uh, reward for building it, so they come to the service of this company and they bundle it with the, with the uh, uh, pool and that installer gets distributed once the customer clicks it and then install, the, the installation goes ahead. And uh, for each installation, this is this is how the monetization works. So for each installation, the developer would, would be rewarded. So right now on the screenshot, we see the actual installers of this particular software. Again, the names are blurred because the developers have nothing to do with that. They are uh, that probably uh, no, just even though they are part of this game, they are uh, fully legit, fully clean uh, installers. So no questions to the software, actual software that they develop. Okay, so the DMG file comes in and gets mounted, and we can have a look at the content of the file, of the, of the directory structure. And if you open up the um, key list, you can see that the key CF bundle executable is responsible to identify the actual uh, binary, the main binary. In this case, it's called advancingly, but there are different names. So it's Whenever you pull a sample from Firestore and have a look, uh, the, the name of the executable will be random. So it's randomized. But uh, uh, random in terms of, uh, it consists of random words. Like fatherless, try house, and tell me, whatever. The name doesn't matter. But just remember that it's, it's random. The DMG file itself is not signed, but the main executable is always signed. And uh, the the uh, developer ID is always valid. It's a valid developer ID, uh, but as it was mentioned in the previous ADA talk, the, the, the uh, developers are cycled. So you can have you can see many many developers. You can't specify which one is most prevalent because they always change. But it's uh, it's always signed, so it bypasses gatekeeper and runs, and you now it's turn to analyze it. Right, so how do we analyze it? First thing, uh, let's have a look at the file entropy. Right here you can see that uh, most of the file has a flat entropy, which is the first sign that the file most likely, or most, most of it consists of some compressed data and or encrypted data, but uh, it uh, falls over, uh, so there is a, a little uh, drop here that's probably responsible for the 
uh, digital signature. Uh, and uh, there is some some area over here which uh, most likely corresponds to the code, to the actual executable code. So you understand that the entropy, so like whenever the file is compressed, so the distribution of different bytes is, is it varies. So you can see, you can meet, uh, you can find and counter any any bytes of any value, and this is where the entropy is flat. Uh, now, remember that because that will be uh, you'll see later uh, what happens with the compressed data. So let's load it up into IDA disassembler. And uh, the first thing that uh, you might encounter, the first thing you might see, that the entry point starts from some garbage bytes that make no sense. There is no valid opcode, there is no actual code to execute. So how does it run if there is no code to run at the entry point? Where does execution start from? Yeah. But, does anyone have an idea? Static initialization. Hmm? Static Yes, there are the, in this particular case, the initialization is delegated to the. There is a concept of uh, lazy and non -lazy, lazy classes. So, what is a non lazy class is also called an eager class. Uh, that's the that's the class that gets realized when the program starts up. That's the first thing that happens. And these classes, they also have the method called class load, as opposed to these non lazy classes that are. Uh, lazy classes, that's the opposite, and uh, these classes that do not have class load method, and they, these classes don't have to be realized immediately, so they are realized whenever they receive the first message. Now that we know this, there must be non-lazy classes that get um, uh, with a low class load method implementation, and that method will be called, called, called first thing, before the entry point. How do we find it in the actual executable? Let's have a look at the actual source code of the Objective-C runtime. Uh, the first snippet is in the Objective-C runtime new.mm. In that file, you can see that it's calling a function called get objective c to non lazy class list. That function returns the list of classes into this uh, variable class list, uh, and it also returns the count how many non lazy classes are out there. Then it starts to loop. And in that loop, it runs up to the count number of non-lazy classes, and for each class in that class list, it calls realize class function. That function itself, you can have a look at the another source code of C file.mm. It's uh, right here. You can see the macro where it uh, uh, obtains the list of non-lazy classes from the section called underscore underscore of C underscore NL CLS list. So where NL stands for non-lazy, CLS stands for class, list. All right, so that's the name of the section. Now let's find that section within the executable file in IDA. Just go to the section, and in the list of all the sections, you can uh, you can find that uh, particular uh, that particular section right here, and proceed to that section. And over there, you'll see uh, two uh, descriptors of uh, of Objective C classes. The first one is called, in this particular case, called listed you pay trick, but it's also a random name. So whenever you pull a different executable, that name will be different. The second objective C class uh, is, in this case, is called arc light. That, that seems to be constant. Now what we can do, we can proceed and find the way the actual code of the plus load method of that particular class, what it does. And if we proceed to that method, you will see that there is a valid code, there is no more uh, rubbish bytes or anything like that, there is a valid code, but it immediately what, what strikes is that that code is doing something interesting, something something uh, that reminds you, probably if you, if you come from the world of uh, Windows Mail, it reminds you, really strikes the, the, the rings the bells, right? So you have, uh, like, let's have a look, you have C character put, put in AL register, then AL is put into EBX plus A. So EBX pointed to the memory area into the buffer where the string is composed, and EB, uh, RBX plus eight means so starting from the start of the buffer, count eight bytes and put C in there. So you'll see goes right right here, and so on. So let me run it as a, a, a little animation. So let's see underscore 
O, termination 0, R, M, and so on. So you can see it randomly composes that name. And once it's fully composed, that name becomes the protect. So what does it do with that name next? Next, it's called calling DLC function. That function will obtain the uh, pointer into the VMProtect uh, function implemented in, in the dynamic library. It's similar to get proc address in Windows when uh, the APIs uh, uh, run, uh, execute, uh, called dynamically. By dynamically obtaining the address of that function, then calling that function by the pointer. Right? So, similar approach. How does it, what does it do with the VMProtect uh, system? What is it trying to do with that uh, function? How it's called? And uh, here is the context of the call of this function. This function is called with five parameters. And you can see first one is uh, own task. Second parameter is, so just by looking at this scheme, it's trying to assign a certain flag to a memory chunk. And that memory chunk corresponds to the code section of the executable, underscore, underscore text. How does it do it? It finds the uh, location. There is an anchor located inside that section. Uh, call it anchor, you can call it marker, it doesn't matter. It's a variable that has specific offset from the start of that section. And it's away from the start of the section by about 3,000 bytes. So what it's doing, it's taking the address of that anchor minus the offset, which gives you the start of the section followed by 14k, that's the size of the entire code section in the executable, and following with uh, vnprop o, that's what that the, that's the flag it wants to assign to its own code section. What vnprop o means, it means a combination uh, uh, of three flags, read, write, and execute. So it initially has read and execute flags, but it also assigns it write access. So it wants to write, get write access into its own code section. Once it does it, what it next next step it, it does, it decrypts that code section with a hot coded 32 uh, byte XOR key. That's XOR key. And again it's random key and if every is good it's it's a different one. And once it's fully sorry, once it's fully decrypted, the code section will have a valid code in it. And after uh, uh, after that the actual entry point within that code section will get control. So it will start executing from the entry point of the executable. The question is, what is that anchor? And uh, if you look at the memory uh, of that anchor, you can see that it consists of encrypted bytes. So once the code section gets decrypted, what does this anchor become? And let's run, uh, in this particular case, I'm using uh, IDA freeware uh, debugger in the debugging mode, and there is a, I was actually using LLDB debugger because it gives the surgical precision to do what you want to do, but for the purpose of this demonstration, it's pretty okay to run at least the script uh, decryption type. <coughs> so uh, let's run it. But when, when whilst it's executed, keep an eye on this memory area where the anchor itself is located. What what becomes with that anchor? So by, by, by the addresses, you can see it's dynamically allocated buffer on the heap, so it allocates it, decrypts the code section into that buffer, and then copies back into the code section. So now it's running. While it's running, EAX gets incremented, so it's the offset into the memory, but look at the anchor. Anchor becomes some text. And that text reads as Maxim, Maximovich Isaev. So some people probably know that, that name. Okay, once again, what happens is we have, after the code section gets fully decrypted, at the start address, you can see a valid code. Now it's valid code, it's a normal executable file, you can see from that entry point. Now, the anchor, before it was decrypted, it's, a, it's gibberish. After it was decrypted, it becomes Maxim Maxim Chisad, which is a, um, a real name of, uh, uh, 
a spy, Soviet spy, who uh, worked uh, in the headquarters of SS uh, during the World War II. It's a fake uh, person. It's, it's a lead character, come from the book, written by Julian Sinanov. He never existed in reality. Uh, but he, by the book, he worked as a deep undercover agent uh, within SS, and he diverted the German nuclear vengeance weapon research program into a fruitless dead end. And, um, well, it's a hidden marker. Why are they using it? I don't know, but uh, I think I, I owe you to explain the, um, the title of this presentation. Why is it called Never Before Hatch Still? It's being so close to fellow. And then the name uh, was Otto von Stirlitz. That was his name by, by the book. Think of it as a Soviet James Bond. Okay? So these days, it's a commonly used phrase. It's, it's commonly used to describe a situation when uh, someone, not necessarily a price, but someone's cover is about to be blown. And uh, it's used in, in daily life in a situation like this, for example, you know, I don't know if you read the news, but there was a below the whale caught in Norway and there was a harness strap which says equipment of St. Petersburg and the, all the news agencies were saying, oh, it's, it must be a Russian spy. So people's response is, yeah, sure, never before hatch tool has been so close to failure. Now, other job situation you can find them online when people use this phrase, it's something like this. <laughs> Or even this. So, okay, but jokes aside, let's get back to the analysis. All the strings, all the APIs are encrypted, and uh, let's have a look at this particular case. Here on the bottom, you can find the fully decrypted string. It means an S application main. In order to decrypt it, it calls this uh, function. And let's have a look how it does it. First, it gets the buffer. It puts into the buffer XMM word, which corresponds to a 16-byte uh, integer. After that, it takes the buffer plus the offset 16 and appends two more bytes. So in total, we have 18 bytes. Following that, it calls the crypt function, and it's implemented right here, when it takes the character and XORs, applies XOR operation with an index, in the first case, it's passed to zero, incremented by some fixed number, like 13. After that, it puts the decrypted byte into the first byte of the buffer, then it runs the loop, where it decrypts all the remaining uh, characters. So uh, the encrypted string becomes NS application main. By reading this code in, in this assembly, uh, you can uh, basically build a script uh, to decrypt all the strings, all the uh, encrypted strings in the in the binary. And you will later see that this particular executable has a module. That module will be loaded in memory dynamically. And by applying this script to the module, as it turns out, that there were 1,228 encrypted strings in that module, and they were decoded, dynamically decoded on the fly during runtime by using over 1,000 different functions. So that the crypt function is one out of more than 1,000. In each case, the function was doing one of three operations, either simple XOR or simple key um, subtraction or other incremental XOR key, like, like here. But in each particular case, there was a different, different key, different number, different value. Uh, but by running the tool uh, it's possible to decrypt them all to understand how the actual what the actual executable is doing. How uh, what, what's what's the logic to understand its logic. What is interesting is that the uh, obfuscation was changed from uh, around 9th of April 2019, and now this uh, imagine this uh, number 13 here, right? So that that number was now replaced with a function call. So what do you think this function is doing? And that function simply returns number six. So you see it's a small mirror. And if you look at it, so let's say, move AL3, so AL gets three. SHL AL2, SHL shift two bits left. By shifting by one bit, they multiply by two. By shifting by two bits, multiply by four. Three multiplied by four is 12. Next, move 12 into ECX, move 65 into EAX, so EDX, EDX will put 0 into EDX. 
ID of ECX, it will divide EAX, which is 65, by ECX, which is, uh, which is 12. 65 divided by 12, whole number is 5. Multiply CL, so multi multiply EAX, which holds uh, 5, with uh, CL, which holds 12, you get 60. Move CL 65 and subtract uh, AL from CL, subtract 60 from 65. That is all this 5, then increment CL by 1, CL gets 6, put 6 into AX, so return 6. So you can imagine the smoke and mirror, the, 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 the hustle they do to return 6. But if you look at uh, hex ray deck compiler, it, you definitely need a license for that, but hex ray deck compiler is it's also cool, but it, it just collapses the whole thing into return 6. <laughs> But again, it, it's also helpful because by doing that, it immediately uh, build. It helps to build a tool that can automatically decrypt all the strings contained inside the uh, the binary. Now, what happens next? The code is doing dynamic uh, module loading. The way it's doing that, it's it locates an encrypted data stuff in its own executable, which is 300, around 300 to 400 kilobytes. So do you remember that entropy, flat entropy, that corresponds to this compressed chunk of data? It lifts it from the executable file, and then it decrypts it, and calls uncompressed API from the loaded libz1 dialog. So it uncompresses it in memory, that chunk of data, which becomes uh, almost 900 kilobyte uh, buffer in memory. Following that, it calls two functions: an S create object file image from memory and an S link module. So, what an S link module will do? It will load that uncompressed buffer as a module, as a module inside it, the address space of the, of the actual executable file. And um, this is when LLDB is helpful because it can. Uh, uh, debug this executable up to the point just before the actual NS link module call happens and give a command image list. Image list will enlist 222 modules loaded inside the executable. Module number 222, it's, it's some system module. Following that, uh, LLDB shows you that the next instruction will be called QR13, where R13 at that particular point. Uh, it's the register that keeps the pointer into the function and that's link module. So by calling that pointer, it will effectively call link module. After the call, so we're stepping over it, so we execute it, and after that, we give it the same command, image list, and the difference is that this time, there will be extra module loaded on the number 223, so one more, the name of that module will be image, as opposed to other full path module names that you see in the list, that one is hard coded. That's how this is loaded under the name image. And the address where that image is loaded at is 101A50. Is it the only extra module loaded in memory? No, there are 265 in total. So there are more modules loaded. Why there are more modules than if it was just one? Because of dependencies. Because that extra module depends on other modules, and they are loaded dynamically as well. So you end up with 265 modules. Okay. Now you can give uh, the commands to LLDB by asking it to read the memory from that address, where the module is loaded at, give you the content of the memory. And LLDB returns you some data, which starts from common signature of the 64-bit uh, Micro binary. So you see this. If you read it from the right to, to the left, you'll read it feed face. Only feed face is a uh, marker for 32 bit uh, micro binaries, but feed, feed face would have to the end, it corresponds to 64 bit micro binary. So you can immediately tell by seeing feed face, you can see that the module loaded is indeed a 64 bit uh, micro binary. From that moment, that micro binary can be dumped from memory and analyzed again, loaded into IDA, analyzed statically to understand what that module is doing. So what do we have so far? This is the overall scheme. Once again, to, to repeat the, uh, the uh, let, let's review the, the architecture. So uh, the execution starts from the 
uh, plus load method of the Objective C class before the entry point. Non lazy class plus load method. That method will take the encrypted text section with entry point in it, then it will decrypt it. Here it is decrypted. Once it's fully decrypted, the entry point gets the control, and this is where the executable starts from, the execution starts from. Once it starts the execution, it will lift the compressed blob around 300 kilobytes, and uh, it will decrypt it, and it will uncompress it into memory. Once fully uncompressed, that module represents itself an engine. It's a powerful engine that can do many things. That module itself has all its strings and APIs fully encrypted, as I mentioned, 1,228 strings in total. The, the engine itself doesn't do much. The engine is driven with the high-level code, and that high-level code exists in form of ASDK. It's written in JavaScript. Again, it's lifted from the encrypted resource, gets decrypted, and that JavaScript will drive the engine to do things. And if you thought it's all, no, it's not all, because apart from that, what it's doing else is going to the remote server and fetching extra tasks, which are also written in JavaScript, and those tasks will drive the engine to do more things. Apart from these things, there is a trickery, which is very common to malware, uh, Windows malware especially, and let's look at one of these tricks, anti-debugging, debugging. So it doesn't want to be debugged, right? So if you load it onto, uh, as the next slide shows, uh, try to run it on the debug, it will fail. Why is that? Let's have a look. Ptrace variable gets a D word that's four bytes, encrypted bytes, correspond to this. Ptrace plus four, two more bytes. Ptrace plus six, one more byte. So we have seven bytes in total. Follow that. Add to D XOR. That's the function that uh, will take the, the number 5D and XOR it with 2D incremented by this parameter. In this case, it's just zero. The result gets, uh, puts, it puts it back as the first character of the P trace, just like you saw the VM protect in decryption. The similar thing. And repeats the loop for, for six more characters, each time calling the same function. In the end, once it's executed, the P trace uh, variable will hold the string called P trace, followed by termination zero. Then it will call DLC, just like before, obtain the function pointer into P trace call. And that pointer is uh, copied into FN P trace variable. Following that, call P trace and return the result. The P trace is called with the first parameter being PT deny attach. What that flag means. If the process is being debugged, that call will uh, it will exit. It will exit with the status of E not sub, which means error not supported. Error code 45. Otherwise, if you let's say you run it and then you try to attach the debugger later on to that executable that's already running, with that flag set an attempt to debug it, an attempt to attach the debugger, will uh, result in segmentation violation exception. So it doesn't want it to, to debug it, right? And in practice, how it looks like, let's say we take LLDB and we say, all right, so run uh, sudo LLDB installer app, right? What happens? It's loaded. Then we give it R, run it. What happens? Process exits and the status is 45. That's the deny attached status. So it fails. It, it won't run on the debugger. How do we overcome this problem? Under the debugger, we locate. The, that's why uh, LLDB is good for this because uh, this is where uh, uh, IDA is not is not it, it's tripping uh, to be honest. Uh, so, but LLDB gives a full control. So with LLDB. Let's put a breakpoint on that location where we are about to call the function that calls speed trace. And here it is. So execution breaks of this call. So this call queue, that address, corresponds to the function that calls speed trace. And then look, the address of that function is F5. The next instruction has the address of F8. 
And that will be something else. That's a legitimate continuation of the code. That's a continuous execution. So what we do at this point, we take legitimate command uh, RE, register, W, write, PC, where PC stands for the instruction pointer. What do we want to write in the instruction pointer? We want to write in the contents of PC, the contents of instruction pointer, plus five. Because this instruction takes five bytes. You see, a five, and that's one of eight. So five bytes. A minus five is five. Ten minus five is five. So we are patching the uh, content of the instruction pointer by giving it a value bigger than by five bytes. And that will effectively uh, and then we say, okay, show me the contents of pointed by the instruction pointer. And as you can see, now it tells you that the next instruction to execute will have the address FA, which is here. And that will be uh, whatever, shared log function. So by doing this, we're sim simply stepping over without calling it, we're carefully stepping over the actual codings of the trace. And then we can continue execution, right? So it won't, it won't trip on the debugger. Another interesting feature is VM uh, detection capability. So the engine has, is able to detect virtual machines by using various methods. Uh, internally, this function is called uh, check possible fraud. And the reason why they're doing it is because, uh, it's a guess, is because they don't want developers to benefit by submitting, let's say they submit and store to various sandboxes around the world. The sandboxes start running it, and with each execution, the developer gets rewarded, right? So they would call it fraud. They would they would consider this as stealing the money from the from the company. So they don't want that installed to be run under the virtual machine under the sandbox. So they detect the presence of the sandbox, just like VMware threats do, VMware and malware. And to detect the presence of the virtual machines, they utilize a few different tricks. The first one, they check the MAC address. If it starts from a particular address that is known to correspond to a particular virtual machine, they will say, okay, now I know I'm running out of the end. For example, 001C42 stands for uh, MAC address that's going for parallel VM. In total, it can recognize over 35 different virtual machines. And here was just a, just a small snapshot of the virtual machines it recognizes. The names you can see here is it's how it's, uh, the, the software is using it internally. So it, it comes from the decrypted strings. Other methods, so it takes the MAC and IP addresses for all network interfaces, uh, get host UID, it wants to know the uh, discrete from the SD name, it wants to know the USB name, vendor name, it could be something like uh, containing VMware or you know, VBox or whatever, uh, display ratio, it reads the mouse position since the last mouse movement event, uh, the, just to see if is the mouse actually moving. Because if the installer goes on and the mouse is not moving, there's something dodgy, right? Uh, now, system uptime since last reboot, because once the virtual machine uh, analyzes samples one after another, it will probably restore each time the system from the current snapshot, and that will reset the uh, time past since last reboot. So by figuring out that that time stands constant, it will figure out that it, it's run under VM. Full path name of the actual DMG file, some sandboxes may rename the DMG file into hash, right, or give it some generic name. So by, by fingerprinting that name, they can identify uh, the presence of the virtual machine, position and size of the app window, mouse position to see if the mouse is actually in use, because if the mouse is not, if you have you seen Mac, there is no mouse movements and no mouse presence, uh, purpose, any sandbox has its own fingerprints, right? So they want to know, to learn, they learn what those fingerprints are, and then by detecting those fingerprints, they, they can detect the common, common sandboxes. Crash logs. The crash log sends get requests, uh, get, get requests to a remote script. And as you can see, another interesting technique, the remote script is disguised under a PNG file. And the, the actual crash log consists of uh, crash, OS, app key, version, debug, uh, backtrace, some parameters. Right? It's just a little snapshot of the crash log data it submits. But again, interesting technique, this guy is not a PNG. Why? To bypass the firewalls. Because 
when, when you look at the locks and you see a normal get request to remote page, you find there's nothing wrong with that, right? But in reality, it's actually reporting the data. Configuration files. There are two types of configuration files. One is dynamically extracted from its own body, and um, that configuration is encrypted with AES-128 algorithm. To locate the actual encrypted uh, configuration file within its own body, what it's doing, it starts parsing the executable from the back up and up uh, to the start, and for each two adjusted bytes, it calculates the difference between them and checks if that difference corresponds to a 7 uh, 64 bit integer. And if it finds it, then say, okay, I found that where that encrypted uh, configuration file is stored. It lifts it, extracts uh, AES key from it, and decrypts it. And here is the snippet of the decrypted configuration file, which consists of things like product file, product description, download URL. This is where the installer actually tries to patch the remote installer, the legitimate installer written by the developer, to run it on the, on the machine and on the system. So you see, uh, and uh, let's have a look at the actual uh, algorithm. So you, here is the familiar feed face with F on the end, which corresponds to the 64-bit uh, uh, header of the micro micro binary, and it does it, it has this loop. Inside that loop, it gets uh, byte at a, at an index minus two. That's a previous byte. Then it gets the current byte at the uh, reference by the index minus one. And from that byte, it subtracts the previous byte. And that becomes the difference. If that difference is a negative number, it adds 256 and checks if that difference corresponds to the signature. And the signature right here, you can see it's a seven integers, 64 bit integers. And if it corresponds, then it will count. So file will, will keep the count of how many matches it has from that signature. And once it reaches seven, it goes, okay, file found injection. In, by the way, it's internal code injection. That's how that's how it calculates and, and locates the location of the encrypted uh, configuration form that, that I mentioned on the previous slide. And the the second configuration file is provided in the form of a JavaScript file. Uh, so it's decrypted uh, along with other SDK files. And that file, have a look at two important fields here, uh, report server, remote report server, and re remote add URL. Report is where it's picking the data. And uh, in this, this is an example where it sends this data to. That's what the, uh, the data is about. Things like uh, HDD size, is your is user administrator or not, is VM. Uh, defined is is it is it running under VM or not? So it all this diagnostics is wrapped into the report. Uh, it's encrypted with AS one hundred twenty eight and it's submitted in encrypted form to the to the remote server. Uh, so it's 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 for reporting, it's for beginning. The second server, add server, this is where it's actually fetching the remote tasks. And uh, the data is encrypted. Once it uh, the data comes in it decrypts the data, and the data will represent itself as JavaScript, and um, the uh, the payload will be wrapped into section name tags. So we'll extract it and execute the tags. So the engine will be driven with this remote task. Now it's probably the time to tell you what the engine can do, right? By the way, the analysis of this task will no normal issues activity in them, but just out of curiosity, to understand full functionality, full scope of functionality of the engine, it's practically a backdoor. The engine can terminate browser process, can set new home page, it can take screenshots. It takes the screenshots at the location of the mouse. Uh, it downloads and executes new tasks. Uh, the, it uh, creates authorization for tasks. System info collection, collecting all sorts of system information, cookies from the browsers, lists of installed running applications, checking the present VM, any removing applications too from Doc. Get info about connecting iOS devices. So the device class ID, serial number. It, can, it, it has full file system uh, capabilities, so it can search for files. It, you know, 
it can save data to files, it can read data, create delete directories, launch tasks, application as root, display alerts, download files, collect network information, and collect in all the detailed information about the system. So it's practically a background. Now, the final questions that uh, come in mind are final conclusions. Well, first thing, it's a very popular bundle. The uh, website says that it has millions of downloads. I don't know if it's true or not, but this is what they claim. The engine itself, the capabilities of the engine, it reminds of a fully written backdrop. Because there are a lot of full access to the system. Memory injection and other techniques, sophistication techniques, stream API uh, uh, um, encryption, uh, uh, dynamic API loading, all these all these techniques, the the, the obfuscation, the, the, the very techniques they they seem they just smell like Windows malware. They just it reminds you if you, if you, if you especially if you've done a fair bit of malware analysis for Windows. Uh, then the things like all the tasks are symmetrically encrypted. So the question I have, what happens if the controller is intercepted? What what happens if if someone inter intercepts the control and feeds rogue tasks into that system. What happens if the developer goes rogue and tries to get unauthorized access to those installers? Having the, the sheer complexity and, and the power of the engine isn't really justified. The trend it backs up, the, 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 it demonstrates, is the, uh, the spill of the traditional uh, Windows malicious techniques. Uh, so it's runtime packing, string obfuscation, as I mentioned. And uh, finally, what I wanted to mention is that there was no malicious activity found in the tasks, right? However, and, and I have no doubt that the company has good intentions by building such a powerful backdoor in the engine. And uh, what those intentions might be, let's say, there is a fraud activity, or there is a sus they suspect that some developers are trying to to milk the system and uh, gain the system, right? And they're trying to get get rewards by doing some uh, fraudulent uh, installations or some replication. So they want to put a stop to that. And to stop it, they might need to uh, extract more information to learn what is the way is it running in the new sandbox, what what is the context of that of that fraud. So for that investigation, they may have implemented that engine, but I personally. Uh, Question: What happens if someone gets uh, intercepts control? Can can you trust those those developers that that uh, have control to the system? And uh, so I have no doubt that the intentions intentions are good, right? So, but we all know what what load is paid with good intentions. So I'll leave it to that, and that's the end of presentation. Thank you. Mahalo. Are there any questions? Thank you. It, it was a great presentation. I have two questions. Um, do you know what is the percentage of macOS smaller who that tries to exit or avoid VMs with these sort of detections? For Windows, it's a, it's a common trend. Yeah. It's been... I, I remember presenting a virus bulletin back in 2007, and the presentation was called Go on Unleash, and, and the whole purpose was uh, disturbing trends that we are dealing with malware that doesn't run on the side boxes. So all sorts of trickery to detect the media. Uh, on Windows, uh, so over, over time, that became, you, you, you look at the obfuscators like Fumita, uh, uh, Enigma, and, and other uh, really hard to be tough protectors, they all they all are capable of detecting the virtual machine. The media just pops up saying, I don't run on the virtual machine, right? Uh, on the other hand, on, on Mac, I personally haven't seen, but maybe maybe I'm not that experienced, but I haven't seen anything that has a VM-aware uh, or VM VM-aware approach. Uh, so that was, a, that was a discovery for me. Uh, but uh, again, I want to clarify that this is not, this is not uh, no one, right? But the technique is there. Uh, and thank you. And my other question is, um, so this level of complexity 
for software malware is commonly seen in Windows, but maybe not as much on Mac. So uh, is it becoming more common to see this level of complexity for a well, as you, as you see, I'll mention one one thing to you. I did mention it during the presentation. You remember I mentioned that in April they have changed the encryption method, the application method. That happens on the 9th of April. Uh, on the 5th of April, Boris Golding published a program for the next for the fourth panel presentation in October, and they put this title on the on the on the website. That was on 5th of April. Four days later, the encryption was changed, shields was gone, and more obfuscation was added. I don't know if it's a, if it's a coincidence or not. I just don't know that. Uh, but the complexity is there. You can see it. It's a demonstration. It's it's there. You can do. You can pull these things, and uh, it pretty much reminds Windows. If you if you if you wanted to predict what happens next, we probably want to. We'll probably we can probably expect. Again, it's speculation, but we could probably expect the complexity of the. Uh, uh, runtime compression and, and obfuscation seen in Enigma, Armadillo, uh, Femida, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So, like the Vim Protect. We could, expect, we could expect that on my, but again, I'm just speculating. I don't have a crystal ball. Okay, thank you.